Well, good evening. Tonight we're going to be in the book of Philippians. And what I'd like to do is talk you through this book as best I can in a short period of time. We've got one standing on one foot presentation to work our way through the book. Now, there's some value to doing this, but there's also a challenge in doing this, and that is that most people study the Bible in, in looking at each tree. I want to look at a forest. You're sitting in a room. It's a villa. It's the first century. You've received a letter from the church planter, Paul. He had been a part of the work before it ever met in a villa. He'd led the first people to Jesus Christ after um, coming into town and shortly before he was thrown in jail for doing so. And as a result, you met Paul and maybe you knew Paul, but you didn't know him well. And by the time he's writing a letter to you, years have passed. And now there's a small group of people that are meeting together that know Jesus as their Savior. Some of them are wealthy, patrician types. Others are quite poor. A few slaves have come to Jesus and have been allowed by their masters to come to the meeting. And now we, we, we get this message from Paul and they unfold the scroll and they begin to read it out loud. And they tell the story of a man who's sitting by the Tiber River. He's under house arrest and he's waiting to see Nero. Because he's been waiting to see Nero, a couple of things have happened. For one thing, progress was slowed in the growth of the church. Paul had traveled 10,000 land miles and he had started all these churches and now he was at a full stop. There was no way he could get out and do anything. He was waiting to see Nero. With the progress being slowed, some attacks increased on the gospel. It, it happened that um, uh, people became emboldened because the existing churches were under attack and, and subgroups were developing. Judaizers were coming in and telling Gentiles that they weren't good enough to, to walk with God and in Jesus Christ alone. And, and so the attacks began to really boil in the church. Another thing that happened is divisions within the church began to show. Cracks in the church became evident. People who should have been mature were picking at each other and picking fights with one another. And so by the time he writes this letter, he writes a very, very important letter to a very important church. But we recognize that with Paul imprisoned, some people began to preach with wrong intentions. Some were preaching in order to make his punishment worse. Can you imagine that? They decided that the best way to give problems for Paul was to start preaching the gospel. A second problem became real to him. He was looking at these, these uh, Philippian believers and he was recognizing that their priorities weren't right. They, they weren't able to prioritize properly the way they were behaving in Christ. And as a result, the end of the letter, he'll address the wrong fruits are being developed. Let me give you one line for the letter to the Philippians. From the root comes the fruit. Bad root, bad fruit. Good root, good fruit. And when, it, when a tree isn't growing properly, it's not rooting properly, it'll shoot roots in a direction that no longer helps it. And as a result, the, the wrong roots will lead to faulty fruits. Now, I want to take a moment and I want to drop into the book, but I want you to know that the letter came in and it was essentially a letter in three parts. The first 11 verses of the first chapter are, in fact, a prayer. And Paul always puts a prayer in each one of these, what we call the prison epistles. He always has a prayer at the beginning of them. And what's interesting is that the prayer shows that Paul offers them a secret. This is how Paul, who was, was in the middle of one of the most frustrating parts of his life. If you're a go-go guy, to stop is hard. Amen? So he's stuck. He's been a doer his whole life, and now he's not a doer anymore. This is a guy who loves to ski, who breaks his leg at the beginning of ski season and watches people come down the slopes. This is a, a guy who's been accomplished at starting churches, and he can't go anywhere. And we've seen it before. God sometimes uses the most valuable ministry in a person's life when they're at the weakest point of their life. 
The thing they don't do well at all is sit still, and that's where Paul has to minister. So God gets his quill moving in order to make up for his feet not moving. The prayer becomes the secret for how he loses frustration and gains a positive heart, and we're going to see that in the first 11 verses. The bulk of the book isn't prayer. The bulk of the book is 11 prescriptions, and these prescriptions are, there's a problem in the church, there's an ailment in the church, let me write a prescription. He writes 11 prescriptions, which I always thought was a high number until I lived in Sebring, and now I know lots of people have 11 prescriptions, and that's not even so many. And then, and then the last part of the church uh, letter to the church is the example that he gives. He gives a pattern. He says, look at my life, look at the relationships of my life, and you'll see a pattern. So we have a prayer, then we have prescriptions, and then we have a pattern. Now, let's take a look at the beginning verses because the first chapter gives you the prayer. And, and the point that I want to make about that prayer is, is, first of all, what prayer is. Because prayer is not coming together, closing your eyes, bowing your head, and talking. Prayer isn't about verbalization in and of itself. You can pray and never move your lips. Prayer, effective prayer, is about the exchanging of burdens, the getting rid of my frustrations and gaining peace. Prayer is the process of exchanging burdens for energy as I spend time with my Savior. That's what it is. Let me say it again. If you verbalize all kinds of requests and walk out of the room as uncertain as you walked in, you didn't pray, you talked. And there's a lot of prayer meetings that ought to be called talk times. Talk times with eyes closed. Because people didn't surrender anything to Jesus and and no peace garrisoned their hearts when they left. Real prayer is the exchange of my frustration with the peace of God that comes as a result. And what I want you to notice about his prayer is if you look at the first two verses, it's a public prayer. He says, grace to you and peace. I thank my God always praying for you in verse 4. So when you look at it, it's a public prayer. But it's not only a public prayer. Listen to the tenor of the prayer in verses 3, 4, and 5. I thank God, always offering prayer with joy in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you hear it? It's not just a, a public prayer. It's a positive prayer. And it projects forward that he's thinking that God is going to act and they're going to get better as a result of it. Not only that, it's a very personal prayer. He says in verse 7, it's right for me. It's right for me to feel this way about you all. I have you in my heart. So, so Paul says, I want you to know that I am personally involved in this and my heart is in it. And I want you to understand that I'm intending that God would do a great work in you. And I know that he will. Now you get down to the end of the prayer in verses 9, 10, and 11. And it's a pointed prayer. Look at verse 9 very carefully. I pray that your love may still abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Love is not blind, beloved. Godly love is not blind. Godly love produces discernment. He's saying, I want real love that produces real discernment so that what? You may approve the things that are excellent. That is prioritize well. When you approve the excellent over the good, you have proper priorities. I want you to love in a piercing laser-like way so that you can prioritize properly, he says. And approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless. I want the fruit of your life to be a fruit that actually bears out blameless behavior. It is wrong for us to assume that that, that the the, um, efforts of Paul in the letter are not to change the behavior of people. Jesus wants to change my behavior. He wants me to grow up, and he wants the blame-filled, guilt-filled, sin-laden, lust-laden life to become one that's blameless. Now, I can't do that, but I can tell you this. By the work of the Word of God, in the people of God, through the Spirit of God, growing up to be a people after uh, who, who look like Christ himself, we can become those kinds of people. He says that's the end point. At the day of Christ... 
I want you to, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In other words, I want the roots of your priorities to bear the fruits of blameless behaviors. I want you to grow up. And so it's a very pointed prayer. Now, here's the thing I know about Paul. In those first 11 verses, Paul got smarter as he prayed. Can I suggest something? So will you. Paul got smarter because God opened his heart to some answers. Not only did God tell him there are answers, God said, let me make you one of the answers. And all of a sudden, you know, it's great to get an answer to prayer. It's even better to be one. And so he got nudged by the Spirit of God, and his quill came out, and he started to say, okay, I think God wants me to actually address them on some of the issues. And as he prayed, God informed him. Now, the next part is a quick run through 11 11 prescriptions, because there was an ailing church. There were some problems that were showing up. What do you do? How do you handle a church when you can't get up and go back, when you can't stand there and, and do a Q&A with them and, and, and teach them the word? How do you deal with that? Well, here's what Paul did. He said, first of all, let me offer you something. I want to offer you some vision. So he says in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Verse 15, some are preaching Christ from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, the knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, verse 17, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. But then he says in verse 18, whether in pretense or in cru- truth, Christ is proclaimed. Here's what he does. He says, I need to clue you in that you see the problem, but I want you to see it from heaven's side of the tapestry. All you see are the strings hanging on the bottom end of the tapestry. Let's fly up and look at heaven's perspective. And from heaven's perspective, here's what I see. I see that God is working through people right here on earth and some of them have a heart toward him and some of them are like Balaam's donkey. But God is going to speak his word and it doesn't make any difference to me how he does what he does because I know he's doing what he's doing. See, vision, real biblical vision, isn't about some kind of political hype. Real biblical vision is helping people see heaven's side of the tapestry. Because on the front, a tapestry is beautiful, but on the bottom, it's just strings. And the problem is I walk on earth, and when I look up, all I see is the strings hanging. And for many of us, we'll never understand how it all comes together until we're uh, passing through the veil of death. And then on the other side, looking down on the tapestry, we'll go, wow, that's beautiful. That's magnificent. But on this side, it just looks like a bunch of strings. So he says to him, it says to the Philippians, I want you to see what heaven is doing in you. And then he moves on to a second thing. Drop down to the end of verse 18. It says, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice for I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. And then he starts into a problem. He starts into this very transparent leadership statement. The longer I walk with Jesus Christ, the more I have a divided heart. Anybody who has actually walked with Jesus knows exactly what I'm talking about. He says, to to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, but I do not know which to choose. You see, I'm hard pressed in both directions. Part of me wants to walk with Jesus here. Part of me wants to come and help the churches. But I'm sitting here not knowing how Nero's going to respond. And can I tell you the truth? I half want him to take my head so I can go be with Jesus. Now, if you're younger than me, you then probably have a great deal of zeal to do whatever you're doing. And you're probably living life, and at this stage of your life, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, no, I I don't really want Jesus to come today. i got a lot of stuff I'm doing. But with each passing year, as the number of years in front of you is shorter and the number behind you is greater, this problem grows, doesn't it? Now, here's my point. In addition to giving people vision and helping them understand God's side of what he's doing, Paul also gave them transparency of his own heart. 
It's wrong for us to think that we ought to walk around with no problems. We ought to be the Teflon leaders. Paul said, I am not sure what I should be feeling right now. He says, I'm walking around going, wow, half of me wants to go to heaven and be with Jesus. Does anybody understand that? Does anybody out there, could you say, I have watched too many of my friends go on and I'm ready to go. Amen? You sit with people who've lost the other half of themselves. And they're feeling like, man, just send me to Jesus. I'm done. I get it. I really do. Now, he goes on in the last part of the chapter. And when you get down to the verses 27 to 30, he offers them something else. A third thing. The third prescription he writes is focus. He says, I want you to cherish one another and see the value in one another. He says, listen, verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come to see you or remain absent, I I will hear of you that you are standing firm, listen, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, the reason I said he put them on a focus of cherishing one another is I believe that one of the things that Paul did expertly as a church planter was get people to see the value of other people in the community. One of the things he did very well was to say, listen, none of you has all the gifts. All of you have some of them. And together you'll make a body. So I need you to stand with one spirit, with one mind, and work together. We have a word for people who have parts of their body that won't obey the head. It's called epileptic. And we have a lot of church bodies that are doing this. We got people that are active, they're busy, they're just not connected to what the rest of the body is doing. And what he says is, I need you to focus on each other so that you will coordinate your efforts and be of one mind. By the way, when you do that, the end of the verses, 29, 30, says the world will be scared and the enemy will be scared. See, when a, when a group of Christians will lay it down and when they will say, I will, I will walk through fire with my brothers and sisters in Christ to be obedient and I will stand with one mind, the enemy has a hard time with that. Well, let's flip that over, guys. If that's the case, if you were the enemy of, of the church, if you were Satan himself, wouldn't you go, well, then the best thing I can do is keep them divided because if they get together and actually have one mind, they'll be dangerous. So what I need to do is I need to keep sowing division, constantly sowing division. It's interesting. Do you know how many times Jesus walked into a synagogue and found the devil there? The devil loves church. He absolutely loves places of worship. It's one of the best places to bring about division. And so that's what he says. He says, I want you to focus on cherishing one another. Go down to chapter 2, and as you begin chapter 2, he opens up with a fourth thing. Now, in chapter 2, it's a very famous chapter, the kenosis, he emptied himself chapter. And in chapter 2, he begins by talking about who Jesus is and how Jesus has done his work and how he emulated for us what we ought to be. In other words, I'm the kind of guy that when I build something, I need to see the picture on the box. Because the picture on the box tells me whether or not this, this doohickey fits on this side or on that side of the thing. I can't get the doohickey and the thingamabob if I don't know what direction it's supposed to be. So I've got to look at the picture on the box. The picture in verses 1 through 18 on the box of Christianity is Jesus himself. And, and literally it says this. I want you to understand that the standards by which you operate, the benchmark of the standards are two. Humility, just like Jesus, and a calm, reasonable demeanor. He says, make my joy complete, verse 2. Be of the same mind. Do nothing from selfishness, verse 3. But verse 4, also for the interests of others. Have the attitude Jesus had, verse 7. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And for that reason, verse 9, God highly exalted him. And and in all the process, I want you, verse 12, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But verse 14, you got to do things without grumbling and disputing. Prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent children, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory and not have run in vain. He says, I want you to understand there is a picture of what you should look like. That picture is Jesus who emptied himself for you and took on the form of a servant. I want that humility to be yours, but there's something more I want. I want you to be the kind of people who work out 
your daily walk with each other and your walk with Jesus Christ without a grumbling, without a disputing, with a a gentleness, with a reasonable behavior and demeanor. There are people who honestly believe that the longer they live in Jesus Christ, the more persnickety they ought to get. That inflexibility is a spiritual gift. It's not. Gentle reasonableness ought to be the hallmark of a person who's walked with Jesus for a long period of time. And he said, I want you to hold out the word of life like a light in front of men. I want you to be attractive. I want you to be winsome. I want you to be caring. I don't want to look back and say, boy, I did that ministry and it was totally in vain. He said, I myself, verse 17, am being poured out as a drink offering. But I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. I want to see you do this because I know if you'll use the standards that God has given and you'll say, we ought to be like this. We ought to be winsome and loving. Then you'll move on. Let me say this. He also offered them something very practical. In verse 19, he picks up some stories of the team. And he he starts talking about uh, Timothy and and Epaphroditus. And he says, I hope to send Timothy to you shortly. Verse 20, I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. I, I want you to know everybody seeks their own interest. Verse 21, verse 22, but you know his proven worth. He served like a child serving his father. I thought it necessary, verse 25, to send Epaphroditus, my brother and my fellow worker and my fellow soldier. He was, he was longing for you all. He was so distressed he became sick. Do you see it? He picks up the idea of who the team members are and he starts talking about the teamwork. He says, I want you to have a fierce unity born out of concern, out of cooperation, out of commitment, out of consideration for one another. And he said, the best way I can show that to you is let me tell you about my team. One of the neatest things that Paul did was he didn't just teach. He exemplified and modeled in his own life. And so what you see are his team members. And you see that in verse 27, when he says Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death, he wasn't saying that lightly. He ended up saying, boy, I'm, I'm so glad God had mercy on him. That would have just compounded sorrow upon sorrow. I don't think I could have taken that, Paul says. We have this image of Paul that he's this Teflon figure, you know, throw anything at him and it won't stick. That's not who he is. Cut him and he bleeds. He hurts. So he's the kind of guy who says, my team matters to me. I am committed to my team. Look at Timothy. Look at the way he's been committed serving me. Look at Epaphroditus. Look at the way he's worked himself to death nearly. And God was so good to me to keep him around. You don't see Paul being sort of goal or let's start five new churches, five new churches with no sense of the people that he's working with. This guy loves his team. And he, and he gives this prescription in his own life. Now, when you get to chapter 3, verse 1, there's a very simple set of words that you know familiar, uh, so fami- with such familiarity. It says, I want you to learn to praise. Rejoice in the Lord. I've I written that before, and I'm writing it again. It doesn't trouble me to write it again. I love to say it. Rejoice in the Lord, he says. One of the things that he calls the people to do is to face the troubles of him being under arrest, of them being pressed on all sides, of Judaizers pulling in, of divisions being created. And he says, I want you to not look at the darkness of the news that you're watching 24-7 as it's telling you all the bad things that are happening and it's filling your heart up with anxiety over the things that aren't happening but might happen tomorrow. I want you to learn to rejoice. I want your song to be about the coming victory of Jesus, not the current victory of darkness. You're going to have to look long. And and I have to tell you that if you think Washington's bad, try working under Nero. So here's a guy who has every reason to be concerned and no reason to be hopeful. And he says, here's the way I'm facing the government. I'm rejoicing because I know that the last government's Jesus. So I'm okay with this one, because they're going to do what they do. But the last government's Jesus, and I'm okay with that. Rejoice in the Lord, and keep on rejoicing. I'm going to keep on saying it. Brothers and sisters, I've said it to you before, but I would offer this idea. 
we complain too much and rejoice too little. We fuss a great deal, and here we sit in a, an air-conditioned room on cushioned seats, surrounded by a government who's not invading our doors, and with all of this wealth and prosperity that's been ours, we do more complaining than the previous generations of believers. We're getting sucker punched. We've got to learn to praise. There's a seventh one. He, he, he called them to vigilance. And, and when you look at verse 2, it says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil, evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. I don't want to give you the impression that Paul said, Hey, I want you to rejoice because nothing bad out there is going to happen. He said, There are people sneaking in. Get a vigilant eye and watch the entrances and exits. Pay attention who's sneaking in among you. And the ability to spot those who attempt to swap religion for relationship, you need to pay, uh, pay attention to. See, he goes on and he defines them. He says, I might also have confidence in the flesh if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh. I was circumcised the eighth day, the nation of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of righteousness, as to the law, blameless. He says, listen, if there are people sneaking in your door trying to turn a relationship with Jesus into a religion. Don't let it happen. Pay attention to what's going on. Be vigilant because they're out there. They're looking for every reason to jump in. And he said, I want to tell you something. Things I used to say, boy, that's important. I count them as loss in verse 7. In verse 8, I count them all as loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. I want to know Jesus. That's what I want to know. And a relationship with God trumps any amount of religious pomp and circumstance. And then he says, I want you to know that there's a goal. There's a goal. I have it. I am very aware of what it is. I want to know him I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. He says, I want, I want the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of sufferings because they're always hand in hand. They never come apart. Any church that really wants the power of God, really wants the power of God and understand the power of his resurrection, better be prepared for the fellowship of his sufferings. Because that comes together. But he says there's a goal involved here, and the goal is the recognition of a process of growth. We've got to keep our eyes out there, and we need to be able to say that we're striving towards something. He says in verse 12, I know that I haven't obtained. I know that I'm not perfect, but this one thing I do, I set aside everything else because I'm pressing for one prize, and that's the high calling of of God in Christ Jesus. So, therefore, verse 15 says... As many as are complete have this attitude. There is no such thing as a mature Christian who wanders in his Christian life. We are goal-focused, disciplined believers, or we are not obedient believers. That's the bottom line. So one of the questions I have to ask is, what is your goal? Are you growing in your goal to know more about Jesus Christ in the coming year than you did in the last year? Or is it okay to go in, have strong goals for my retirement and strong goals for my business, but go into autopilot my Christianity? See, that's not right. By the way, there's a ninth thing. He said there ought to be resolution. You know, he opens up chapter four and says, I long to see you. I long to... To, 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 to have my joy and my crown, my ministry. But I, I need you to do something. Verse 2 says, I urge you, Odia and Syntyche, to live in harmony in the Lord. One of the prescriptions that we have to have in the modern church is that, that there will be divisions that come up between us. See, everybody in this room isn't alike. Some of you, like me, understand that heaven food is chocolate and others are fallen among us and actually believe that vanilla is equal to chocolate, which of course it isn't, and you'd be wrong. Some of you, honestly, what you tune on your radio sounds to me like a bunch of cats on a hot tin roof. I'm a classical guy. What I'm trying to say is this. We don't all see things the same way. And can I tell you the truth? God-loving, spirit-filled believers still have personalities. 
And as a result, even if we were all 100%, 100% surrendered in every area of our life, we wouldn't all like the same flavor. So that means there's always going to be in ministry the preference issues. And the preference issues are, well, I don't like the color they chose for those chairs. Did you see that? So when you're done all the theology, if you can manage to get a group of people together that agree on some of the basics of the word, you're never going to get them to agree on the offertory. That's not going to happen. And so what ends up happening is that there's a need for resolution. And so he says, I want you to know that you need to live in harmony. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also, verse 3, to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. He said, I not only want them to have resolution between each other, I want the body to help them to have resolution between them. Do you know how many times I've been in churches where they feed the fight? They feed the fight. And he says, I want you to feed the resolution. I want the body to come together and help them the way they helped me when I was struggling to get it all started. And then he says, I need you to do something else. I need you to pray, but not just pray. He says, be anxious for nothing. Quit worrying, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God that is resultant, that passes all understanding and comprehension, will garrison and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He said, I need you to understand something. In the beginning of this letter, I exchanged the frustration of sitting under a light chain waiting for Nero. I exchanged it with the peace of God. And I want you to be doing that as well. You're stirred up because you're not praying. You show me a congregation that's at peace, and I'll show you a congregation that's at prayer. Let me flip that over. You want to show me a stirred-up congregation, I'll show you one that doesn't want to pray. They want to get busy. They want to learn. They want to work. They want to evangelize. They don't want to pray. Because the peace comes as a result of the prayer. That's what he says. The peace comes as a result of the prayer. You want peace? Then the prescription is prayer. If you got a headache, you go in the medicine cabinet, you open it up, you look at the Tylenol, and you go, okay, I own Tylenol, now headache, go away. That's how we handle prayer. The theory of prayer people believe in, the practice, eh, not so much. Let me go to the last one, deliberation. The word deliberation simply means the intentional selection of thought. I need you to look at how you're thinking. Because you're doing what you're doing because you're thinking what you're thinking. So he says in verses 8 and 9, there's something very important. The things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, excellent things, praiseworthy things. Those are the things you ought to be thinking about. I think we ought to take our TV guide and lay it next to that verse. I think we ought to take the movie page and we ought to lay it next to that verse. I think we need to ask ourselves, have we spent so long in fantasy that we haven't spent time in reality? I think we entertain ourselves into oblivion. I believe I live in a country that has entertained itself into a moral morass. I think the truth is that what we'll do is say, well, that would be wrong for people, so we'll animate it and make them fuzzy bears, and now they can do what would be wrong for people, and now we'll all go see it. We'll call it a different kingdom. We'll make it some long ago far away place or make them aliens and then we'll let them do things that God's word says people ought not do and then we'll laugh about it. And here's what we've done. We've just found a way to not think the way God told us to think. We do what we do because we think what we think. We think what we think because we allow the thoughts to be entertained in our hearts rather than to deliberately, intentionally select. You know what, Smith? You're not going there. Do you do that in your mind? Do you go, okay, mind, no. I know where you want to go, and you're not going there. You know, we control. frankly, I know a whole lot of Americans that control their dogs better than their minds. And they're getting bit by their mind. So he says, I need you to to deliberately select thoughts that please God. What's the benefit of that? 
Well, we leave a pattern behind us. That's why verse 9 says, the things that you learned and received and heard and seen in me, those are the things I want you to practice. And then the God of peace will be with you. Wait a minute, there it is again. Peace comes through prayer, but peace also comes through the behaviors that are built on solid, deliberate, intentional, godly thinking. You mean that I can actually create turmoil by sin? Yes. Welcome to America. People who decide to live outside the rules and then they can't understand why it's not working for them. Listen, the prosperity that belonged to our land belonged to it on the shoulders of people who made decisions to walk within the framework of morality of God's word. It's not a mystery. When we no longer have marriage or when you can no longer see what a marriage is, expect to have a lot of messed up kids. It's not good when we have marriages. It'll only be worse when we don't. And when people grow up and realize that they can be perpetually immature and self-focused, what we'll do is we'll give them all labels and drugs and get them through school and release them out into a culture where they get another card to get food stamps And another program that they feel someone needs to care for them in. Why? Because people don't grow up when the models around them are immature. And so Paul says, look at what you saw. Look at what you heard. Look at what you saw in me. Do that. Now, that raises the question. And it's the final question of the book. Okay, Paul, what did they see in you? What, What was your demeanor like? And that's when you get to the pattern. The last part of the book is all about the pattern of Paul. What did Paul look like? He gives a seven-part pattern. And in verse 10, he opens up with, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Here's what he does. I love this. The first thing he does is he celebrates that they sent him some, some income instead of complaining about when they didn't. See, self-focused people go, well, you know, I've been here, sitting here by the Tiber River in this stinky little cell here waiting for something to happen, and I haven't heard from you. You know people like that? And, And here's the interesting thing. Instead, he goes, thank you for sending that to me. And then he goes on and he explains why they didn't send it before. And he tries to explain to them, I understand that you weren't, didn't always have opportunity. In this last part of the chapter 4, he says, I understand that sometimes you lacked opportunity. I recognize the time wasn't right for you. Does it sound like he's focused on his need or their ability to give? His other, other person focus is really interesting. I skipped down to verses 19 and 20 just to pick up this idea, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And he says, to God the Father be glory forever and ever. He's celebratory about the way God provides rather than complaining about things he's lacking. Now, the second thing that I see about him is that in the second half of verse 10, he offers concern, not a command. You, you were concerned, but you lacked opportunity. He says, I get it. You, you cared about me. The fact that I didn't get a check was because you lacked the opportunity to give it. Now, let the government fail to roll out checks on time and you won't hear this kind of concern. What you will hear is, how dare they, you know, and I understand you put into Social Security. I understand how that works. My point is this. You walk next door. I promise you this is true. You walk next door. You ring the doorbell of your next door neighbor, whether you know their name or not, and you give them a $10 bill and you say, I just love living next door to you. You give them a $10 bill and you go back home. The next day, you go and you ring that doorbell and you give them another $10 bill. And you just tell them that same thing again. And you do, you do that 30 days and in the 31st day, they're going to knock on your door and say, where's my $10? Because we very quickly come into the idea that we are an incredibly special people. And people ought to be paying us to be here. And one of the things that happens is what starts off as a privilege ends up being a need. What? What? She says, I can't live without a microwave. I mean, think about that for a minute. Young couple's about to get married. He wants me to live without a microwave. Wow. What a Neanderthal. That's horrible. 
See, one generation's convenience becomes the next generation's necessity. What he does is he says, I'm concerned about you, and I understand you lacked an opportunity. You know what else he did? He did something else that I think is really good. He said in verse 11, I'm not speaking because I want. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. That's a good word. I don't hear contentment. Our society is fueled by constant lack of contentment. You have the iPhone 5. You need the 5S, and it's going to come out in October. You've got to have it coming now. Start camping the night before. You've got to have it because it goes one millisecond faster than the one you already have. And when you're dead, you will have saved 15 milliseconds. You'll get there faster. And that's how we think. Advertising agencies have one job, keep you constantly discontented. Don't let them be content, because if they're content, they won't buy our stuff. Down the street, Stuff Mart makes a living by putting stuff. How many of you know this is true? You went in for two items and came back with 22. And you don't know how you were living without the other 20. You just don't know. (gasps) Wow, they have a scrubber that does that? Well, I'm sure that mine is dirty. I better take care of it. And this is how we think. Constant discontentment. And Paul said, you know what I learned? This bread's a little hard, but it's pretty good bread. I, I can deal with it. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if a church worked hard at teaching contentment. If we would just hammer away at, I want you to be content, I can tell you the businesses in our town would hate us because we're the people that want to walk in and buy five things we didn't know we needed till we got there. Then in verse 12, he says, I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to cope. I know how not to be careless with what I have. You know how you get along with humble means? You don't waste. That's how you get along with humble means. Extravagance and waste are the product of people who are careless, not the people who are trying to cope with very little to cope with. Then he goes on and he says, by the way, I actually grow. I grow. I, I pull in strength to myself by walking with Jesus. He said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'm not a consumer of Jesus's power. I'm a collector of Jesus's power. What I do is I collect up the times I have with Jesus and I store that preciously in my heart like a guy who goes off to war and has the letter in his pocket from the love of his life. That time I had with Jesus this morning, I walked through the day and I thought back to it over and over and over and over, and it was wonderful and warm. And I am filled with him. He also says in verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. And he confirms what they're doing instead of, instead of criticizing why they're not doing more. One of the things we do, and we learn it as parents, is that there is, are two ways to get Johnny to do right. You can do the carrot or you can do the stick. And one of the things that Paul did was a lot more carrots than sticks. We remember him for the tough stick positions. Stop doing this. Put that guy out. Don't allow that behavior. But a lot of his words were very confirming. They weren't critical. They were, oh, I'm so glad. You've done well to share with my affliction. You, you've done a good thing. I appreciate what you've done. And then he gets down to verse 15 and he says, You yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no other church shared with me in the matter of giving. You alone did that. He says, I want you to know that I remember what was done for me. I remember the consideration you had in my heart, and I want to speak as one who's considerate to you. One of the ways to guarantee you won't get respect is don't give it. And one of the ways that you can help ensure that you do get respect is to show it to others. Consideration works like respect. Here's the bottom line. First century believers, as you gather in that little room, here's what I'm praying. 
I'm praying that you will have roots that spread in the proper way so that you go grow fruits that are worthy of the Savior that you serve so that when you stand in the presence of the Savior, he will reward those fruits and I will know I have not run in vain. And here's the bottom line. The fruit comes from the root. Bad root, bad fruit. Father, thanks tonight for the opportunity to look through this book. Thanks for the opportunity to just fly through it and and understand a little bit more of its prescriptions. I pray that your people would be led by your spirit and that we would root ourselves not in the affirmation of the world, but in the truth of the word. And that our behaviors and our deportment and our, our, our manner of life would show that we look more and more like Jesus, who was the picture on the box. Thank you for your love tonight. Thank you that we have not only a God of truth, but a God of grace. Because there's not a single believer in this room that can live solely based on truth without grace. That grace is what's provided our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. And I